everybody and welcome to Pine of Science Live Tours. My name's Gerana and it is so great to see you all again for our third installment of our live tours. Now, uh, just as a reminder, the point behind live tours is we get scientists to go take us around their lab and show off all the cool fun things that they get up to and give us a little bit of a behind the scenes look at all the fun things that could be happening. Now we have asked our scientists to pre-record their lab visits so that we don't disturb any of the science that is happening and also it means that we can stop, pause and rewind to see all the fun stuff that might get missed on a tour or that you might want to see a little bit closer. So with that being said, throughout the live stream, if you uh, want us to stop or have a look at something or have a question to ask our lovely uh, tour guide for today, uh, all you need to do is either write your message in the live chat that's just off to your right of the screen, I hope, or it might be somewhere else around your screen on YouTube Live. Or alternatively, if you prefer to use Twitter, you can use the hashtag PintAU21 and we'll uh, get your tweet uh, onto the feed and I'll ask the questions for you. Now we will uh, have the tour and then afterwards we'll start asking some of those uh, larger, more meatier questions. But if at any point you want us to go back and have a look at something, just let us know in that comment to give us a bit of context as to which point you want us to have a look at. As there is a little bit of a delay on the feed from what I see and what you see. Now you might notice as well is that I might look off and dart my eyes in different directions. It's not that I'm losing interest, it's actually that I'm looking at my team members just to uh, grab some cues from them or having a look at the video feed or having a look at my notes. And I, that's because I've also got this lovely team of volunteers behind me who are moderating your questions and sending those through to me. And I've also got a team of video experts who are helping me behind the scenes to control the videos. So with that being said, when we hold events at pubs around Australia, we ensure that we recognise the local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations, one of many that makes up the continent that we now call Australia. Now we're holding this event online and our speakers and much of our audience are streaming from around Australia. So we want to acknowledge our traditional custodians of country, the first innovators and scientists of the land. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present and recognise their continuing relationship with the land, waters and culture. We especially would like to pay our respects to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which our tour will be based and also where I am based to, um, and showcasing from today. And now, at that point, I'd like to now introduce you to our tour host for today. Uh, his name is Dr. Melrose Brown and comes to us from UNSW ADFA. Hello, Melrose, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Welcome to Pint of Science Live Tours. Now, Melrose, uh, just so that people can get to know you a bit better, could you tell us a little about, bit about yourself and what you do? It seems to be that we can't hear you, Melrose. Um, we seem to have some technical uh, issues with your audio. Um, give us two seconds and we might try again really quickly. Try now, really quick. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Awesome, excellent. So excellent. if you could just start again, uh, just so <laughs> we can actually hear you this time. Uh, what are you up to and what do you do? So I'm a senior lecturer here at UNSW Canberra Space. Um, my research involves space domain awareness. So that's understanding what's up in space and why it's there and what it's doing. Um, and related to that, space traffic management. So understanding how we can better manage the space environment so we don't have satellites crashing into each other and causing um, destruction up there. Um, I also do a lot of education. I'm the program coordinator for our space master's program and I'm also um, quite involved in our undergraduate teaching in the space area too. Nice. And uh, I have two questions for you before we get started, just so that we get to know you a bit better. Where your lab? What do you? Th what are the main things that get? Uh, I've lost all my words now. Uh, at your lab, what are the main things that you get up to, or your uh, researchers get up to? So we've got um, a lot of different activity here. So a lot of what you hear today is 
kind of from my perspective as opposed to um, uh, maybe other people's perspective, um, the main kind of draw card that, that stands us out from other groups are our small satellite research um, program. So we design, build, test, and fly our own satellites. Um, they're very much research and development satellites, so they're not operational. We're looking to develop new types of sensors, new ways of using these satellites, and, um, and, and put them together and see what they do. My research is more about um, using those satellites to um, a, like benchmark and calibrate our, our systems on the ground. So we want to be able to um, detect more objects in space and do a better job of understanding where they are and where they're going. So having our own satellites up there that we can control and have um, real data from them to tell us exactly where they are means that we can check whether the measurements we're making are actually um, accurate or not. So you'll see a bunch of stuff today. A lot of it will focus on the spacecraft build, but towards the end you'll see um, a little bit of footage of our telescopes um, and also some of the modeling and simulation that we do. That's a really important part of the, the puzzle with um, space environment modeling and also um, astrodynamics, as we call it. So uh, modeling the forces on objects up there um, being a, a, a real focus for, for a lot of the work we do. That sounds like there's a lot going on uh, in a, probably what is a small amount of time. <laughs> so. With all of that knowledge that we've now kind of heard about, I think I'd like to start getting into your tour and start having a look at some of the videos. Uh, and just a reminder for all the audience members out there, if you would like to ask us questions, ask Melrose your questions, the hashtag is hashtag pintau21. It is also in the YouTube description if you're going to ask on Twitter or uh, ask on YouTube live chat, which is just off to your right. Alrighty, team, can we have a look at the video? Let's get started. So, whoa, look at us go. Really are traveling at the speed of light, right? Hang on, hang on. Uh, let's slow down a bit. So Melrose, where are we and what, what are we doing? So this is our campus. Um, we're University of New South Wales, but it's the Canberra campus. So we're located at the Australian Defence Force Academy. Um, that relationship started in, I think, 1985 or so. and. Um, Basically, UNSW provides um, the, the cadets here their undergraduate education before they go forth into the um, into the various services, Air Force, um, Navy, and an Army. And and this is the main um, kind of the main entrance. So that tree you can see ahead of us, that's the the tree of knowledge. Just beyond there is the parade ground. So I, I don't know if anyone's had been in Canberra when the students are graduating. They have a, a big parade on there, which is really cool, flyovers with big big planes. Um, there's also a lot going on there in um, Open Day, which I think is in um, August sometime. So it's a really interesting campus because we have this um, unique relationship with defense. Um, and we do have these kind of two roles. So kind of everything to the right-hand side of that image, um, that's mainly, um, Kind of defense related so that's where the cadets will um, uh, that's where their accommodation is um, and lots of other facilities for them and everything to the left is really where a lot of the um, the teaching goes on that's where our lecture theaters and research labs are so I'm not in the military I'm um, a Scottish by descent and um, a lot of the just about all of the PhD students and researchers um, are, are civilians. Um, so yeah, that's it's an interesting shot because it, it really is the, the separation between those two elements of what we do. Yeah, right. And I guess like even though there is that separation, there is also that cohesion working together to try to achieve a common goal. Is that correct? Yeah, it's very much two sides of the same um, coin and it means that we, um, as we continue to grow and build that relationship, then we can um, help to understand the sorts of problems that defense would like to have solved and the research um, challenges in there. So certainly with space, um, there's a whole heap of really interesting challenges that straddle both the civilian domain and the, and the defense domain. So it's, um, and, and space is not necessarily unique in that point, but it's all, always been a, a feature of of space going all the way back to Sputnik and things. Really big science outcomes from the launch of that satellite, but it also um, 
really marked a lot of um, interesting activity during that um, Cold War period as well. Yeah, right. That's so cool. All right, let's keep going with the footage and see where we end up. Gosh, I wish I could walk this fast sometimes. So where are we heading over to now? What's so this we're place? heading over to the concurrent design facility. So um, we walk past the coffee shop, which is obviously the most important part of the whole Hold uh, up. campus. So hang on, hang on. We, we probably need to go back to find this coffee shop. Um, yeah. So we keep going back. Tell us when there to you stop. Go. Just up to the left, kind of ah. there. Um, All right, everyone take note. Um, this is where the coffee shop is when we go visit. Okay, All yeah. right, keep going. That, yep. That's where all the, all the research gets done is uh, over coffee. So this is into um, building 15 and we're going to the um, Australian National Concurrent Design Facility. So this is really the, the start of the satellite design process. We are um, unique in the country with this facility. It was um, built on an engine from the, the French space agency, CNES. Um, and the idea behind this room is that you get all of the engineers and stakeholders into one place and you um, rapid, rapidly iterate um, different ideas about how to design a space mission. So a more traditional approach is quite a linear kind of like waterfall model as they call it. So it starts at one end of the train and uh, it sort of slowly moves down. And the, the problem with that sort of design approach is that you, um, if there's a problem or a, um, a, a wrong assumption made at the start of the process, you don't really figure out till you get to the end. So you have very long times to um, develop your, your missions. But if you throw everyone in together and you've got the right facilitators and a good software engine backing it up, then everyone can start designing and iterating. And um, when this room's full and, and things are happening, it's a very kind of dynamic experience, lots of um, ideas flying around. And if someone changes numbers in a spreadsheet for say propulsion, that will flow all the way through to our mechanical engineers and our electrical engineers and, and even the cost and time breakdown as well. Wow. And so, hang on, how, how fast or how long are these meetings that are happening? Are they like 20 minute conversations? Or are we talking like three years? How long do you lock them in this room to get the four? So it, it really depends what it is you're, you're doing. It will be a number of sessions um, and you know, again, it depends what you're doing, but the way we found things work quite well is a series of half day sessions. So you've got this intense period for half a day, then you can maybe go away and, um, you know, do some homework and, and, and figure out what's happening. So typically two weeks of those half day sessions would be a kind of typical example. We've done a few recently with say, um, Geoscience Australia and um, BOM, for example. I'm um, looking at different mission concepts to help them, um, yeah, achieve what they would like to achieve. Oh, that is so cool. And so this room that we're looking at right now, that would be filled with people. They've all got their own computer. And what what's usually on the big screens that we can see in the background? So I can see it's Bucky now, but I want to come back to that. What would we usually see on the screen if this was happening real live right now? What would be happening? So it's quite cool, you can throw, um, so anyone sitting at any one of those computers can throw what they're looking at on the big screen. So if you're kind of busy typing away and this really cool outcome happens, you can throw it on that big screen and say, hey everyone, we have got, Houston, we have a problem, um, <laughs> look at this. Um, or maybe you've got a, um, you know, a really excellent idea or, or, or just a, a really good way to share with the rest of the room. That um, big screen at the very um, end there, so um, sitting sort of just above your head, basically, um, that's a big touch screen um, monitor, so you can draw on it and things. So, um, you know, you could get the cricket on there and do your own um, analysis if you if you wanted by, um, yeah, pausing the action and, and drawing drawing lines to things. So it's um, yeah, it's a really fun space to um, to work and do things, and it's also a really good. Um, educational space as well. So we often have um, a like year 12 students in and other outreach activities. And, you know, in the space of that half day with a very cut down um, design experience, we can we can walk them through that whole process and, and let them have a go as well. Wow, I wish I was a school kid now just so I could have that experience. Now, um, I alluded to a Bucky before. Uh, 
We've actually got a question from the audience, which I'll let you uh, explain afterwards about what Bucky is. But Tom wants to know, is Bucky a mission code? Uh... It's, um, so uh, the very first mission that we did, and I think we'll, we'll have some images of this um, later on, um, was called the, the Buccaneer Risk Mitigation Mission. So it's the acronym's BRMM, which isn't so good, but it's more affectionately referred to as Bucky. Um, that program was in collaboration with the Defence Science and Technology Group, um, and it was it did a lot of different things. But its main um, role was to try and test out um, different technology that's really important to the main mission and really set up the um, all the different elements that you need to be able to do a mission, both for us and DST. So it's 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 one that's very close to my heart. That was my first ever. Um, satellite missions we started that back in 2014 or or 2015 or so um and it's called bucky just as a um, affectionate term um to refer to buccaneer that is adorable so you started that one in 2014 but how um joe actually wants to know from the audience how many days does it take to fully design a satellite from let's say from the prototyping all the way up to getting it out into space a, so that really um, that really depends on a whole heap of factors. So you know, if you wanted to do a big um, you know, like Cassini, which is a, a, a satellite that went out to Saturn, for example, that was like twenty or thirty years of, of mission, and that's um, you know that's a massive NASA mission, and and those sorts of timelines are really huge. And the, the way that you would design those and the things you have to do are um, very different from what we do, which is about doing things um, on a much shorter time frame. So more like a year to two years between um, conceiving of the project, um, designing, building it, testing it, and, and getting it into orbit. A M2 Pathfinder, we did that in around 12 months, I think. Um, Buccaneer took a lot longer than that. It was maybe a couple of years, two, two and a half years to get it onto orbit. Um, a lot of the, the thing that takes time is not necessarily the technical pieces as well. There's a lot of um, a setup that you have to do. You've got to get a lot of approvals to be able to launch things. Um, if you've never done it before, like in the case with um, Bucky, then you know you've got to kind of measure tw measure twice and cut once. You've um, you know you're breaking new ground. And you're not entirely sure um, a you know how how slow or how fast you should go in places. So you, there's there's always extra time in there. But once you've done a few of them like we have, um, the ability to do bigger and better and more complex missions and involve more complex payloads um, grows. So as the mission complexity grows, the, the time to do stuff also increases. Um, then there's things outside your control. So COVID was a really interesting one last year, obviously, and we were supposed to launch last year and that um, changed things around and we ended up changing um, which rocket we went for, which means, yeah, haven't, there's a lot of different things you have to change if you if you suddenly change your, your rocket supplier. So, you know, anywhere from like 12 months up to, you know, maybe three years if you're doing quite a complex mission, I would say. Wow, that that is a lot of variation. And I guess also like depending on what type of satellite you're trying to make as well, um, because I, I think I've heard a few terms and um, I might uh, get you to um, tell us the difference a bit later, but I hear that's like there's cube satellites, there's small satellites, large satellites, and maybe um, the understanding of what, what a uh, general member of the public thinks is a satellite might not be what actually what you work on. But I know that there's some footage coming up soon that showcases those satellites. So I think let's keep going and we might uh, come across it first. Cool. Oh. So yeah, this is just us walking through the concurrent design facility. Um, yeah, lots and lots of screens, as you'll see. Um, those um, kind of glass walls there, they're whiteboards, so people can be up frantically scribbling on those whilst everyone's um, working away on their various um, computers. Um, we've got um, we've got a coffee station behind that back wall. Again, caffeine is um, yeah dr driving force of a lot of how, how I get through the day anyway. But um, but it is important to have that breakout room as well. So you know periods of intensity, 
And then, um, yeah, those breaks can also be when a lot of um, good ideas come through. Um, so, yeah, that's important. Oh, I saw some chocolate as well. That's very important. Yeah. Um, this is from one of the outreach um, events that we did. So I think these are, don't think they're year 12 students. I think they're actually um, university um, students. Um, and yeah, they're, they're going through that design process. So now we're on our way to um, our main building. Um, <laughs> There's our, our space um, our space picture that was taken by a drone during one of our retreats. Um, and this little guy here, that is Bucky that we were just talking about. So um, as you can see, it is about the size of a loaf of bread, the main, um, the main body of it. But we've got these um, big um, antenna sticking out. So that, um, that yet those four yellow things are, are literally tape measures, so sprung steel, um, and they're um, they're all wound up in in what we call a tuna can that sits um, on the, the the end of the um, end of the cube set. So it's it's a bit like a, a tape measure that's got four tape measures wrapped round instead of instead of one. And then when that got onto orbit, it was um, deployed, so it was a spring loaded mechanism, and that all came out, and then those four antenna um, folded out. That was um, DST's main experiment, which was to detect high frequency radio waves from the Jindalee over the horizon radar network. Um, that's, a, I think it's like a billion dollar defense asset that's in the north of Australia. And the really cool thing about this mission is that something about, you know, that size, lo loaf of bread, um, relatively low cost, um, could be designed and launched and, and operated by um, Australians, well, it was launched in, in the US, um, but it adds a lot of value to that billion dollar um, asset. And that's where small satellite technology really comes in. So there's, there's only so much you can do in a very small form factor, but if you've got a really good idea and you've got some, um, some really good new cutting edge technology, then these small satellites give you that opportunity to um, to throw them up there and start adding lots of value into the um, Australian sector without having to go through these 20, 30 year, um, you know, billions of dollars of expenditure that a more traditional space program might might involve. Mm. And so, okay, so uh, this satellite, which uh, I think, is this one of those ones that they call a cube satellite? Is that the te technical name or is that the, just like, is this like Bucky? Is that the name that all the sci space scientists call it for fun? So um, CubeSats are, uh, so, so this is a 3U CubeSat. Um, the way they define a cube is it's a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube. So that would be a 1U CubeSat. If you stack three of them end to end, then you get, um, you get this guy. So we've launched um, a Bucky, which is a 3U. We've also launched M1, which is another 3U and um, the M2 Pathfinder satellite and all of those with three U CubeSats. The one that we've just launched um, this year, 22nd of March this year, um, is a 12 U CubeSat um, with a difference. It's, um, it's 12 U's, but then in a few weeks time, so maybe um, sometime in June or maybe, um, maybe a little bit later in July, that 12 U CubeSat is going to split in half and turn into two six U CubeSats and um, run off and do um, some some really cool and, and fun things. We'll, we'll maybe get to that a little bit later. But um, yeah, we've kind of um, very much leveled up from the 3U um, form factor into the 12U um, space. Um, I, I would say that the 3U form factor is probably the most common CubeSat that's being launched currently. There's not a great deal that you can do with 1U and, and, and 3U seems to be that kind of, um, yeah, that price point that people are, are happy with on, you know, how much does it cost to build and launch? Um, and yeah, you can still do quite quite a lot with it. Wow, 3U, how, how interesting. interesting. Okay. Let's, Let's keep, keep going, going with the video. Oh, I see some lovely photos. 
Yeah, so these, um, we, we've, we've only recently just put these up actually. Um, so we've got a whole heap of photos that our media department have taken over the course of um, time. That big one on the bottom right there was actually taken from our spacecraft. So that's an image of the Earth from our own spacecraft. Um, that is the entrance to the boss's office. Um, <laughs> and just behind us is our operations room actually. That's where um, Courtney operates the spacecraft from. Uh, we've got a few more um, images up there. That's our um, our antenna dish out at Yes. Um, that was Lena. She was a PhD student with us, looking at 3D printing structures. M2. Um, that's our telescope um, and and some more testing. Hopefully, we we'll get to see some real stuff rather than a, a video of a, a photograph. Um, so this is the <laughs> flight room that we're going into now. This is where. Um, the majority of our engineers um, live and work. Through that glass window is our clean room, and that is where we um, assemble and integrate our spacecraft. Is that where we're about to go into now? Uh, this is uh, electrical room. So this um, this isn't a clean room. It's a cleanish room. So um, <laughs> it's um, um, it's it's where the, a lot of soldering and um, a kind of manufacturing of some electrical components happen um, but the clean room is is what we're going into next and that's a really um, important and special place so um, this is a class 100 clean room which means there's um, let me get this right um, it, it's the, the the class 100 is about how much um, how many particles are in the air so it's like a hundred particles per cubic meter of air. And I think this means that we have the cleanest clean room in Australia. We'll see some other um, bigger facilities, um, but it's really important that when you're dealing with your flight hardware, that you don't get any dirt on them. And that involves um, stuff in the air, so aerosols and other particulates, as well as stuff in your hands. So we'll see that is actually Bucky in that box there. That's uh, um, a nitrogen purged box. So you pump nitrogen in there um, to try and um, keep it nice and clean. So there's a higher pressure inside the box than outside the box. So anything that wants to try and make its way in is going to get going to get blown out. Um, likewise, in the um, room itself, there's a lot of um, filtering and air conditioning. Um, everyone that works on the satellite um, has to be very um, careful and they wear their their various um, gowns and gloves and things and um, I think the most important part is that they don't let me in there to touch the satellite <laughs> it doesn't get it doesn't get broken um, so that's Bucky you can see that tuna can on the top there that was where that big um, antenna got deployed from um, this is Simon and Jay working on M1 which was the next satellite that we launched from there You'll maybe see in a second, they'll zoom in and you'll get a closer look um, of what's inside that um, payload. Um, I think they'll take the bit of, um, it's not sticky tape, it's capped on tape. It's very, um, <laughs> very important. Um, so as they tipped it over there, um, you can see the whole thing's filled with electronics. So um, CubeSats are, are largely um, boxes of electronics flying in the sky. We didn't have any optical payloads on this one. It was all about detecting RF, uh, a radio frequency transmissions and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think we can get into M1 a little bit later on. Um, that bit that we were just on there, that photograph. Yeah, sorry, just before we get onto that photograph, we've just got a question really yeah. quickly about these uh, lovely scientists here. So you've mentioned that this is a clean room, you know, we're going to be careful of everything, but what about the dandruff? Why aren't they wearing hairnets? Oh, you you will see hairnets um, later on. I think this might have been our engineering model rather than our final flight model. So um, a really good question, though. Um, you'll see in some of our later footage, which will come up at, at some point, when we're doing the final testing up at um, Mount Stromlo, which is a, um, an environmental test facility run by um, ANU, the Australian National University. And yeah, it's like one of the, I don't know if you remember the Intel adverts from back in the back in the day when everyone's in the full 
bunny suit. Um, so yeah, you, you, you will see people fully kitted out there. Um, I think this one that they're working on here is is maybe the, um, uh, that, that might be the engineering model. So we get different, um, a, it's almost like a prototype. So it's, it's, it, it's exactly the same as the thing that we launch, but um, it's our trial run and you can get it a little bit dirty and, and you're really using it to see whether it will test functionally or, or not. Um, and then for your actual flight model, that's where you've got to be super extra careful. And, you know, when you're um, tightening bolts up, you need to make sure that they're being torqued to just the right amount. You need to double and triple check everything because if you've got a, if you forget to plug a wire in or it's a little bit loose and you launch it, you're never going to hear from that spacecraft again. So having an engineering model that you can do things a little bit uh, quicker with um, and you can check that everything works is quite a valuable thing to have. But um, yeah, the, there is that change in, um, in cleanliness and care as you get towards the, the actual flight model integration. So a little bit of creative um, artistic license in the video here, I think. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you for uh, allowing that creative artistic uh, direction for us so we could see roughly what it would look like. Now, you said about this photo. Let's go have a look at that photo again. Oh, I think it was coming very soon. Oh, now we, we've got this awkward moment where we just yeah, uh, we've, need to go we're, up to we're the all, video. We're all poised for the... <laughs> It's really cool how much you've managed to fit inside those cube sats. Like they're so small. Uh, here we go. Here's the photo. Um, so another really cool thing you get to do is um, meet astronauts. So um, uh, Charlie Duke and um, Jerry Griffin came to visit us. So Charlie um, was an astronaut back in the Apollo days, and Jerry was a um, a, a mission controller um, deputy. Deputy Mission Controller, I've, I've probably butchered his, his title there. So they were, um, you know, really important people in the um, U.S. space program. They were on the, the the Apollo missions, you know, going to the moon. And um, and part of our job, as as difficult as as it, as it is, um, is is to get to meet some of these wonderful people and and share in their experience. So there's a lot of um, technical stuff we do about um, building satellites and testing things and screwing it all together and, and launching it um but it it really is all built on on people and their expertise and their ideas and their creativity to get us out of the um the holes that we um that we find ourselves in and being able to meet um people that have you know been to the moon and and have done some truly amazing things is really important to um to kind of motivate us and, and, and help us keep keep pushing forward. So that was a really um, a really special day, and yeah, a bunch of us got a got a photograph standing beside them. So they're the the people in the blue in the middle at the front there. Wow, so cool. Who's your dream person to meet, Melrose? Oh, that's a. That's a challenging question. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think I have a, a specific. Uh, there's so many people that would be um, great to to meet. You mean of all time, so you could have, you know, your. I think I think it has to be someone realistic calendar. that like is actually actually possible. You know, like that uh, is an aspiring goal. That you know, if that person saw this web uh, stream, they'd be like, "All right, I'll make that happen." I'll make Melrose meet said person that is still alive. Probably oh. space related would be ideal, but you know, if there's like. <laughs> That's, um, I don't know. There's so many, um, there's so many amazing people out there doing some, some really good stuff. And there's probably a whole heap of people that, you, you know, I don't even know the name of. So some of the really big, um, science instruments that are being um, de developed and delivered. So like the James Webb Space Telescope that's going to, you know, allow us to look back in time to, you know, almost the start of the universe and all of that stuff is is really cool. And, um, and the people that are going to do all the science of it. And sometimes we kind of focus on the, 
the, the picture of a single person driving all of this, but it's it's not really. It's you like the really big science that's being done right now is being done by teams of tens or hundreds of, of people. So I think it's more about you know getting to go to those places and soak up that atmosphere and the culture and you know how do you do these things and 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 who are the people and and what does it look like and and what does that success look like i think that's more what i would prefer to go to if if that answers your question no that definitely does i was just curious because i saw the the photo and the signatures and i was like ah oh, maybe you've got a different person too now um this satellite that we're looking at here um sorry i'll let you have a drink of water first yeah <laughs> it it looks so this looks like now testing the knowledge that you've just taught me. It looks like a, a one U or a one qubit U CubeSat thing. Am well, I even remotely close? Is it one unit? Oh, oh it's a it's a six unit um, CubeSat. Um, it's, oh. uh, it's a slightly odd six U. So I said at the start that it was a twelve U CubeSat that we split into two um, six U. So we um, it's normally we, we split it along um, the, the 3U axis, so it's, um, it's more cubic than a standard 6U would look like because we, um, yeah, we kind of cut down a, um, an, an odd side. So this is the M2 satellite with um, some of the sides removed so you can see some of the bits and bobs there. So on the bottom you can see the solar panels um, folded out, so the other side of that would normally face towards the sun. Um, although we do have a few on the underside, just in case we're pointing in the wrong direction. Um, you can see various antennas um, sticking out to the left there. Um, UHF is on the end, so that's our, um, our main um, uh, communications. It's the, the one that you can all, uh, more easily contact. Um, and then we look at different bands with those um, crossed ones. Um, and then you can see some of the um, the telescopes and the um, we've got software defined radios and different patch antennas to pick up um, a different types of signals doing the RF piece. Um, and there's lots of other things on there. So we've got four different optical payloads on this um, on, on this spacecraft. So we've got a main telescope that images around three meters ground resolution. So anything kind of um, a three meters and above we're able to um, resolve with that camera. Um, we've got a star tracker, which we can use to look at the stars, and that's used to, to provide us with more accurate um, navigation and control of pointing. Um, we've also got what we call a selfie cam, so that's for taking um, a kind of lower resolution images to check that everything's deployed properly. So the lower resolution, so you can get the image down quicker, and it's a lot, it's quite lightweight. Um, we've also got something called an event-based sensor. That is a new type of camera from the uh, University of Western Sydney, and that operates in a very different way from your typical um, camera type sensors you're used to. So that detects change rather than um, a recording actual images. Um, we've referred to it as the, the uh, colloquially as the T-Rex sensor before. Um, based on Jurassic Park. Um, so if, if nothing's moving, it's just a gray a gray screen. But then say you're taking an image of this room that we're in, and I'm not moving, it would just be a gray background. But then if a fly flew across the screen, you'd see this big streak come across. So if you're trying to detect um, satellites flying around or rocket launches or anything like that, it's really good because it's not uh, you don't have to process all of that um, stuff you're not interested in you just pick up the the motion which is the the things you're interested in wow that's really cool oh that's so many interesting things so what are we looking at now so this is the orbit of the um spacecraft so um you'll see and then yeah this is it um splitting uh... into two um we made this animation like yesterday or something so uh... <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> um, and yeah, these are the solar panels deploying. Okay, we've got to the um, uh, the tracking. Do you want us to go back? 
Yeah, we'll go back a, a, a touch. So maybe we'll go back to the orbit piece where we saw it flying over the the Earth, because there's a couple of things in there that are um, important to recognize about how space works in low Earth orbit. So that red line is the um, the orbit plane, and if you look closely, you'll see the spacecraft flying around. Um, we're in uh, um, inclined orbit around um, 45 degrees, so that um, the angle that that plane makes um, changes over um, time. It starts to process around the world, and that is a, a, a feature of um, Earth's gravitational force. So the Earth isn't a perfect sphere, it's a little bit lumpy, and that causes your um, orbit to start to um, drift. Um, all of this is important when you're trying to plan when you're going to see the satellite from your ground station, um, and then what the satellite's going to see um, when it's flying around. So it's seeing different parts of the Earth at different times. It's also seeing at different times of the day as well. So if we want to um, use our um, telescopes and our RF sensors to do um, the main mission for M2, which is a maritime surveillance mission, what we're trying to do is um, image ships and automatically detect them using a bunch of artificial intelligence and onboard programming and all that cool stuff uh, on board the spacecraft. But we're also trying to listen to them at the same time. So every ship has a um, AIS beacon. Don't ask me what AIS stands for. Um, it's a beacon that it that it sends off to um, tell people who they are and where they are and all of that. So. We're trying to detect that beacon and also um, a correlate it with the, the images we're taking. Um, so you can only really take the images during daytime. So all of the mission planning needs to take into account the fact that you're spinning around the Earth 14 times a day, you're going from day to night, and that point on the Earth is spinning underneath. So it's a bit like tapping your head and rubbing your, um, rubbing your belly to kind of coordinate all of that stuff. That is so interesting. Like, I know I can't do that, but also like the amount of mathematics that would have to go into that to try to just figure out, okay, when are we going to time this photo to go? And I guess you've also got to time into the code that you write, right? Being like, well, okay, you know, the sun's going to be open. Um, you know, it'll be easier to see the sun. I can get daytime photos at this time and then I can move to this mode. And then, oh my goodness, like in a project like this, like we saw that there was that um, the, the room where we got to see like a whole heap of people together to try and prototype. But when it comes down to it, how many people does it take to make this happen? A, a, Roughly. a lot of people. <laughs> so we might see in a, a later video some of the photographs of the team holding the, the spacecraft. So at one point we had um, up to 50 people in the group, depending how you, you count all of them. Uh, we've contracted a bit since then, and we're more at around the 30 mark, depending how you count them. That involves all the different bits of research. So we spoke about how um, you know the spacecraft really ties together the stuff we're doing with the ground and the simulations. So the team that build the spacecraft are a, quite a large and important part, but we've got that other arm there as well. So it's um, it sort of depends how you choose to measure it. You know, how many people does it take to do all of this? Um, but modeling and simulation and having those software tools to help do all of that planning is is really important as well. So one of the things that we have um, here is a what we call a flat set. So it's uh, it's all hardware that goes into the slide, but sort of plumped on the desk. So before we send any commands to the spacecraft, we'll test it all with hardware on the ground to make sure we're not sending anything up that's going to cause it to um, switch off and not switch back on again, for example, which would be really bad or, um, yeah, or you know, switch off the radio. Yeah, you need um, to be in space and be like, oh gosh, forgot to turn it on. Anyway, let's keep going with the video. I am aware of time. We've still got your third video to look at. So we've got your fun animation where we see all these solar panels come out. And then where are we now? So this is a, our Falcon telescope. Um, we've got a few telescopes um, in our, um, in our uh, stable. One of them is that Falcon telescope is one node of a network of 12 around uh, the globe. 
Those are owned and run by the US Air Force Academy in Colorado. Um, that is a really cool bit of equipment and it means that we can access all of those 12 satellites to do space surveillance. We've got a, a, different, a different telescope that does kind of similar things, but with slightly different properties out at Yass, which is a small um, town just outside of um, Canberra. So we use those to track the tells to track the um, satellites to try and update the orbit from a when, when we see them, and also do um, a range of a different roles to try and characterize what the spacecraft are doing. So as they fly and they spin around and do stuff, the the change in that angle with the a uh, change in the angle relative to the sun means they start beaconing a bit like a lighthouse. So they're the satellite's spinning and light's reflecting off them, so they glow brighter or dimmer. And a big chunk of our research is to try and use what we observe with modeling and simulation to back out what that motion is. So if we start looking at um, objects that we don't know things about, to try and infer what they are and what they're doing from that signature of um, brightness intensity changing. So the image that we're seeing now with this animation that's what the satellite's picking up, right? That's not what the telescope's doing. It, the telescope is just a receiver of the information, isn't it? So yeah, this is a this is a slightly different um, a strand of research that we have. So in low Earth orbit, there is still atmosphere um, from the Earth. So the the Earth's atmosphere kind of stratifies as you get up quite uh, into higher um, altitudes. And around that kind of three to four hundred kilometer mark is is what we're simulating here. Um, that's when you hit the ionosphere, and that's where energy from the sun has started to kind of rip electrons off the molecules in the atmosphere, and you get this plasma that floats around the um, the Earth as well. Um, understanding what that plasma does is important for a whole range of things. So um, it can disrupt communications between satellites and the ground. It can mess around with radars. Um, if that um, plasma and the space and uh, weather space environment um, gets really crazy with lots of energetic particles coming from um, the sun, then it can fry electronics on your spacecraft. It can also affect things on the ground as well, like power lines and things. Um, another big impact that it has is drag on the satellite. So if we want to be able to predict where they're going to be in the future, we've got to account for the um, atmosphere that they fly through and the, the drag that it imparts on them. So typically people just use um, empirical kind of analytic um, formulations that are a little bit like that, um, you know, tweak a few parameters and, and you'll get a reasonable estimate. What we're trying to do here, what we are doing here, is um, trying to simulate that with um, a lot more physical real uh, fidelity and reality. So better prediction is of density, so we can predict where a satellite is going to be better. Um, but it also allows us to do um, lots of exploratory science to understand how the sun and the Earth interact to um, cause these effects. I mean, you've got to get bang for buck if you're throwing something up into the air. Uh, you're really, uh, wow, there's lots going on. Now, I am aware of time, so we're going to keep going and pushing through just to make sure we can see all your lovely videos. So this is this the same satellite that we've been talking about this whole time? Yeah, um, so that's, um, these are like 3D printed models of um, our satellites, that's M2, that's M2 Pathfinder down there. Um, those are the mission patches. You can't have a mission without a mission patch. Um, and that <laughs> one on the right there is M1. Um, I spoke earlier about engineering models. These are the M2 engineering models. Um, so they're um, yeah, representative sizes. This is Bucky in its Perspex box. We've got a lot of promotional shots of people staring lovingly into Perspex boxes. Unfortunately, um, I have not been allowed to stare into Perspex box yet. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's is that the ultimate goals. honor? <laughs> Yeah, it was one of my goals to have the Perspex box um, image. But yeah, that was a very proud moment. That was, um, yeah, Bucky fully integrated. And I think it went off to the US to launch shortly after there. Now, I think I see your boss in there too, don't I? Yeah, Russell is in the back there um, looking <laughs> on. We've got um, Simon to the left standing up. He's um, at Melbourne now. He's um, an integral part of the... Um, 
the Melbourne Space Program at the, the university there. Um, Doug Griffin sitting in the back there, he was our chief engineer, now works uh, for Skycraft, which is a spin out from our company. Uh, at the front on the left is um, Igor, he's our chief um, electrical engineer. Um, and, uh, and then finally on the right is Arvind, he was our lead software designer, but he now works for the space agency. So the, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a good photograph to show how things have evolved and moved on and the, the activity that we do here kind of um, really helps to push into the Australian space sector and, and hopefully grow things for, for the good of, good of everyone and, and push the sector along a bit. Yeah, and that's that really that marrying of like science and industry, how they're both talking together to really get that research happening, but also getting that product out that we need to be able to answer those new questions as well. Now, let's keep going. I want. I think I've got more photos coming. Whoa. Yeah, so that's M1 in, um, in soft focus. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, Christopher Pine back when he was the <laughs> Minister for Defence. Um, and yeah, Bucky again, I believe that's um, a, a group. You can see how much the team has grown between that Bucky yeah. photograph and the M2 Pathfinder one. Um, and that's um, M2 again, another rendering of it on, on orbit. Um, those are the real spacecraft. Um, a, and, and this is um, testing in the Mount Stromlo facility. So we might have a bit of um, a video next, but Ooh. once we fully integrated our spacecraft and we really want to um, check that everything is working properly and also comply with what the rocket launch provider asks us to do. So we need to prove that when we shake it and we, it's in vacuum and all of the thermal loads that it's not going to break because um, they are um, really keen that they're not going to have broken spacecraft floating around with all of their other payloads on there. Um, so we go to the ANU's facility at Mount Stromlo to um, test um, test our spacecraft. Wombat XL is a really big thermal vacuum chamber. Um, as you can see, you can, you can fit people in it. Um, I think that's an oven to um, bake out some components and do some thermal um, testing. So there's a bit of moisture in the air when you um, transport things. So um, you usually have to bake them out before you um, do main testing. Um, and everyone climbing around in there um, are, are getting ready for the test. So there's a whole heap of activity that needs to go on to be able to do all of this um, stuff. Um, you've got to instrument the models. You've got to have a whole test plan. Um, you've got to make sure the order in which you do your tests makes sense so that you don't um, have to you know, unscrew a panel to get to um, something inside the spacecraft after say you've done your vibration test because you're not supposed to um, take things apart after you've done that final test. So a lot of kind of logistics and planning go into um, this and it's really um, the sign of a good program is um, is really having all of those logistical components in, in place. So, you know, having really cool ideas and really cool technology is important, but to really implement it and have um, a valuable outcome, you need to have all of that um, support around it too. So now uh, we can see now that everyone's wearing hair net, so I presume this is like the even fancier version of um, no dust. Now there is an audi a question from the audience, uh, Amy wants to know, why is it necessary to keep the satellites clear of dust, um, clear, clean and free of dust? So. Um, a, once you get into space, you're in quite a, a challenging environment. So you're in a vacuum. So if, if you've got any um, fingerprints or any oil or anything, then when you're in um, that vacuum and you're also in a, um, it's not a zero G environment, you're in free fall, but yeah, you've all seen what happens on the space station, things float around. So um, when you're in that low pressure environment, um, things can outgas. So if you've got fingerprints or you've got um, muck or particulates, those can um, change into a gas and float around and they can start to coat um, your sensitive optical instruments, for example, and that degrades them. Um, other things that can happen as well is you can, um, a, you can have 
a say you've you've got a conducting um, bit of dirt in there that can make its way and, and plunk itself on some sensitive electronics and give you some shorts. You can also have um, a yeah things to do with um, the the soldering as well. Um, you can get this kind of cold solder and these big wisps happen and, and things like that. So um, dirt is really bad because it can break your spacecraft and it can damage your, your sensitive optics. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, no dust. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, um, what are these folks up to? Like, I can see they're moving a few things around from inside. What what part are they working on currently? So, I'll, um, a... I'll have to kind of make this up as I go along a little bit because I wasn't actually there when they were doing this. Um, so this is for the thermal vacuum test. So what they're doing is they're, they're laying a bunch of um, wires in there to get all of the data out. So you've got the um, the sensors that you um, have on board your spacecraft normally to do all of this stuff. Um, they're, they're not able to communicate wirelessly through it because it's a big metal tank. So they're going to run a what we call an umbilical cord out of the um, out of the tunnel to get all of the the normal spacecraft data, um, but they also want to check that the thermal model that we've made for the spacecraft, so we've simulated and modelled this, um, they want to check that that's valid as well. So they attach a bunch of um, thermocouples, which are temperature sensors, and they've got to route all of those wires out and make sure they don't get in the way and, and things like that. Huh, and. I see that our team has stopped it at a very strategic moment here. Um, before we see this go off, because I think we all know what's going to happen when we play this video. Uh, yes, it's a rocket. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this rocket just really quickly before we play the video? So this is um, a rocket lab rocket. They're a New Zealand launch company do um, yeah, really cool things. Um, this was Does that mean it's launching in New Zealand? Yes. Yes. So, um, and, hey, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but um, why don't we launch things in Australia? Uh, we don't have any rockets at the moment that, um, although people are working on that, you've got a few different um, companies. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the one of the main reasons there isn't a launch opportunity here just yet, although that may well change in the coming um, short number of months or years. <laughs> okay, cool. So we're looking at Rocket Lab in New Zealand. Yep, so we're a secondary payload on, on this, um, and that's very common for CubeSats. Um, there's a main payload on there that the people that are paying for most of the, the launch, I believe that was probably a US defense payload. Um, and that will weigh, you know, a couple of hundred kilograms or so. Um, and then you've got secondary payloads. So there was us, there was Fleet Space, which are another Australian um, Internet of Things um, company. I think maybe Mariota also had a spacecraft on there. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and I think there was one or maybe one or two other secondary payloads. So um, you kind of get dropped off when you're on your way on the way to the main payload getting um, uh, dispensed. Um, so you've got in the middle, that's where, you know, the main expensive thing is. And then dotted around the side are these dispensers for, um, for us, the, the secondary payloads. Um, so yeah, that's it on the rocket pad. We were all sitting together in a lecture theater here with their fingers crossed that um, nothing horrible happened on the way up. Um, and yeah, it, it launched and everything went, went really well, thankfully. Hmm. All right. It's time. Let's see this launch. <laughs> I'm really excited. Yep. There it goes. It's very nice to see it go. Um, in my previous life doing hypersonic stuff, we I was in Norway for a, a subsonic launch, so I didn't go into orbit and we um and I was in the in the car park watching the launch after actually being there and it and it wasn't actually successful, things went wrong. So um, I'm always very, very nervous during launches because I've experienced uh, an unsuccessful launch. But um, yeah, Rocket Labs did a really, really good job for us there. So um, that's the second stage. The first stage has dropped away. The second stage has um, ignited. And um, 
yeah, launches, goes into orbit, does a few, uh, a couple of laps to catch his breath, and then it starts to um, deploy the um, payload. So that is a um, uh, artist's impression of M2 getting launched from the the final stage, um, and yeah, that's that's us. Wow, looks like you do some pretty epic things. And uh, you've got the audience on your side. They've actually started a hashtag campaign for you for um, perfect box for Melrose. So hopefully one day you'll be able to look into a perfect per Bex box. And uh, we'd like a little bit of credit. Don't forget to tag hashtag PintAU21. Oh, I, I, I certainly will. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so we're all looking forward to that. Now, we want to ask you, now I know we're, we're just on time right now, but I want to make sure we can get one more question in right before the end. Uh, now, just see if there's any last little question or a large question. Ah, okay. I have a question for you, Melrose. If you had one piece of advice for any aspiring rocket scientist, or let's say instead of a rocket scientist, a space scientist, because we're a little bit different to an astronomer or maybe not just a rocket scientist in general, someone wanting to get into the field of space science, what would you say for them? Oh, come to UNSW Canberra. <laughs> That's... <laughs> um, I mean, you're not wrong. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll say that with tongue cheek. Um, so I, I guess... Um, it's, it's hard to say because I really kind of fell into this, right? And I think everyone in Australia that's currently working in space found their way to the field through pretty weird pathways. So I'm from Scotland originally. I did aerospace engineering at uni, um, then went to work on helicopters, then came to Australia for a PhD in hypersonics, ended up in Germany and then went to Brisbane and then came back to down here and then ended up doing um, space. And that's not um, a particularly unusual sort of pathway for people to get into this. So a lot of the work that we've got ahead of us in the um, education sector and then also in you know, government and industry is to try and create those more defined pathways. Um, space is very broad as well. So it depends what you want to do. If you want to build um, rockets then um you know an aerospace engineering degree is a is a pretty good place to start but it requires a lot more than than just the aerospace part so a lot of that is um you know fluid mechanics and aerodynamics and propulsion and things like that there's control systems on there there's um software that needs to be a uh, written there's um, all of the regulations and all of that piece that comes into it as well is also crucial for being able to do that. So um, space it itself um, requires people from a whole range of, of different backgrounds and it really depends what you want to do. So if you want to do the, the science, so you're kind of the, the end user, then um, you might be um, you know, more towards the physics realm. Um, but if you want to do the engineering and, uh, and build things, then, you know, every single engineering discipline um, comes into play here, including civil engineering. You saw on that launch that, you know, it's a, it's a big rocket launch pad and it's got to withstand a whole heap of um, forces. So, you know, I think the the main thing is to be really interested in space and to um, be involved with as many things as you can be involved with. There's, there's lots of really good supportive groups. We've um, had the, the pleasure of the Australian Youth Aerospace Association being um, uh, connected with us throughout the, the years. We've had a lot of really, um, really good people come through that. Um, there's lots of other initiatives in the science front. So, Joanna, you'll probably have more insight than I will into you know, the sorts of programs that Waves has. Um, <laughs> certainly, um, every university is going to um, be more and more involved in space. So go to Open Days, um, contact people like me and other people, um, you know, have a look at what's um, actually happening out there and, and don't be shy in, in coming forward. And then as you kind of progress through, through high school and get to that point of, you know, what degree should I choose, hopefully you'll have you know, be steered in, in roughly the right direction. Um, and then, yeah, from there, just just 
just go hard and be be really interested that's that's the best advice i'd have that sounds like some pretty epic advice and yes you did allude to my previous job working at australian academy of science so um there is a space science uh strategic plan that's going to be launched in the coming months or hopefully within this next coming year and that addresses a lot of the questions that what will space science look like in the next five to ten years and some of the leading scientists including yourself Melrose have um, provided their input into what does science space science look like and what can we look forward to so um, make sure you give the Australian Academy of Science a follow thanks for the plug Melrose um, talking about plugs so you mentioned that uh, people might want to follow yourself or follow your field where what what should we do do we find you we, we've got your Twitter handle what else can we do so UNSW Canberra has got a Twitter page, but um, I think UNSW Canberra Space LinkedIn page would be a good place to see, um, keep up to date with the things that are happening with um, M2. Um, broader space um, activity in Australia, for those of you that want to come along to things like the Australian Space Research Conference. Um, last year with COVID put a bit of a, um, a uh, yeah, made conference is challenging, but hopefully as we go forward, there'll be a lot more events to, to get back to um, a little bit more business as usual. Those are really good to, to, to meet people. Um, on the industry front, there's the um, space industry. Oh, I forget the, um, the acronym. Space in, are, um, do you are. mean SIAA? Space yes, Industry Australian Association, I think it is. That's the one. Um, yeah. So there's, there's lots of those events. The Space Agency is a really good one to follow on um, Twitter as well. They will, um, they're really good at, um, at highlighting all of the um, interesting things that are happening in the space community as well. Um, other ways to get involved. Um, I yeah. think there's Ooh. also, isn't there a, uh, a youth organization for, uh, people interested in space. Uh, there might I can't remember be, the name off the top of my head. <laughs> they, they, they obviously decided I was too old to invite me along. So <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, undoubtedly there will be um, organizations um, such that I, I, I don't have the, the name off the top of my head. Um, That's okay. Yeah. I think I think uh, our users will be uh, able to have a quick Google for Australian youth and space and sh surely something will come up. Um, yeah. But I think uh, I'm just aware of our time and we have gone quite over time. So I think we are now at the point where we need to start wrapping up. Melrose, thank you so much for your time today and chatting us through and letting us have a little bit of a peek behind the scenes. I understand that uh, it wasn't probably the greatest time for you folks, seeming you've only just launched your rocket, I mean your satellite. And so you don't have any footage that you could do real time, but thank you for finding all those images and uh, B-roll, I should say, or previous content that you could share with us. It was really, really great to see. Uh, so to start off with, thank you so much for that. Now, for everyone else in the audience, if you are wanting to get a bit more action on Pina Science, uh, we have still got events for the rest of the week. There is a tour this Friday coming where we will go into a different lab, this time a fertility and development lab. So if you wanna find out more about what a different lab compared to a space lab might look like, please come along and check it out. Details are on our website and the lovely volunteers uh, working the live chat will uh, put in some details for you. Now. With Pino Science, we are a registered not-for-profit organisation. That means that we rely on your love and care to make these events happen. So with that in mind, if you've got a chance and you've got a bit of cash to spare or you think we're doing a bloody amazing job and you want to support us even further, give us a donate. Here's a QR code. Link's going to be in the description if you ever need it to go to there. But if you're more of a person who likes a bit of uh, merch along the side, you could uh, instead purchase some of our merchandise. This year, the theme is Planet B with your artwork inspired from Ban Ki-moon by Fee Do. So have a look and check out that. We've got t-shirts, pint glasses and pins and so many cool things with the lovely artwork on that you're seeing around us today during this event. 
So with that being said, that does bring us to the end. Don't forget to like and subscribe either on the YouTube page. You can go back and review and have a look at this video again, along with any of the other uh, events that you did miss. Give us a follow on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, whichever platform you prefer. We are also on LinkedIn. Um, so maybe while you're there, you can follow not just uh, us, but you can follow uh, UNSW Canberra. But that brings us to the end of today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that you've just had an out of this world experience, just like I have. I'm sorry, I had to pun. Thank you so much, everyone. Farewell, enjoy your night. See ya. Mm -hmm.